Thanks for joining us at the Canadian Breakpoint, a Canadian infectious diseases podcast by Canadian infectious diseases physicians. I'm Summer Stewart, here with Dr. Rupina Pirawal, pediatric infectious diseases physician in Saskatoon. In this episode, we are excited to welcome Dr. George Zanell, Department Head for Infectious Diseases and Medical Microbiology at Max Rady in Winnipeg, and the Research Director for CARA, the Canadian Antimicrobial Resistance Alliance. Today, we'll discuss CLEAR, or the Canadian Leadership on Antimicrobial Real-Life Usage Registry. Dr. Pierwall. All right. Thank you, everyone. Welcome to another episode of our podcast, The Canadian Breakpoint. Today, we have a very, very special guest with us. And after I do his introduction, I think the viewers will also feel the same way. Um, so th- thank you, Dr. Zanell, for joining us today and taking time out of your busy schedule, um, because you're a very, very busy person, <laughs> um, to be on the podcast. It's honestly an honor for us to have you on the podcast today. So Dr. Zanell is a microbiologist and pharmacologist who received his PhD in the Department of Medical Microbiology and Infectious Diseases at the Faculty of Medicine, University of Manitoba, and a Doctor of Clinical Pharmacology at the University of Minnesota. He is presently Professor and Associate Head in the Department of Medical Microbiology and Infectious Diseases, Max Rady College of Medicine, and Research Director of the Canadian Antimicrobial Resistance Alliance, CARA. Dr. Zanell is the founding and chief editor of the Canadian Antimicrobial Resistance Alliance website. Dr. Zanell has published over 1,100 papers, chapters, and abstracts in the area of treatment and prevention of infectious diseases. He has presented over 1,200 lectures as an invited speaker at international, national, and local meetings, speaking on the topics of antimicrobial resistance infections, as well as treatment and prevention of infectious diseases in Canada, the U.S., Central and South America, Western and Eastern Europe, including Russia, Australia, Southern and Northern Africa, the Middle East, and Asia. He has been extensively involved in treatment guidelines for a variety of infections in Canada, the U.S., and internationally. Dr. Zanell has received or been nominated for more than 100 teaching awards, including the Canadian Association for Medical Education Merit Teaching Award in 2020. Congratulations, Dr. Zanell. Thank you. Dr. Zanell is also a member of the Who's Who in Medical Sciences Education. And in 2022, he was elected as a Fellow of the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences in recognition of sustained excellence in research and teaching within health sciences. Fellowship in the Academy is considered one of the highest honors for individuals in the Canadian health sciences community. In 2022, Web of Science identified Dr. Zanell as one of the world's most influential researchers, selected among elite group recognized for exceptional research influence, demonstrated by the production of multiple highly cited papers that rank in the top 1% by citations for the field and year. Also in 2022, Dr. Zanell received the Dr. Fred Aoki Career Achievement Award in recognition of a career of dedication and excellence in multiple domains of medical microbiology and infectious diseases, including research, education, clinical practice, service, and administration. So amazing. I'm so honored uh, to have you here today, Dr. Zanell. And today we're going to be talking about a very, very important topic, which is known as the CLEAR Registry, that Dr. Zanell will give us more information about. Um, And so why don't we just start off, Dr. Zanell, by telling the audience a little bit about what CLEAR is and when when it was established and and how how did this come about? How did this registry, this national registry come about? So, Rapina, let me start by saying how delighted and honored I am to be with you on this podcast. And I also apologize. My mother sent in this mini biography, and I apologize. It just goes on and on and on. She didn't even put in there that I uh, finally got out of diapers when I was 15 years old. Lots of accomplishments. (laughs) Uh, uh, I'm delighted to be with you. So CLEAR, let's talk CLEAR. CLEAR stands for the Canadian Leadership on antimicrobial real-life usage registry, 
clear, C-L-E-A-R. And how this came about, it came about in 2019, was traveling extensively across Canada before COVID, speaking at every hospital and university about new IV antimicrobials in Canada, uh, their properties, et cetera. Right. And colleagues would stop and talk to me. And one of them was Dr. Ted Steiner, uh, uh, an ID doc in Vancouver. And he said, you know what? It's great you're talking about these antibiotics and you're doing research on them. But when they come to Canada, we yeah. need to have some sort of platform. Infectious disease specialists, medical microbiologists, clinical pharmacologists, when they're using these drugs, they can actually share their experiences with other Canadians. And that way we know in the Canadian setting, treating patients with the Canadian antimicrobial resistance rates we have, yeah. how are we using these drugs? For what infections? What pathogens? And you should do something, he said to me. And that's how it all started. That's fantastic. Honestly, I think having that, I think the emphasis on having real life experience and, and real time experience. And I think we've talked about this before. It's fantastic that this information is presented to prescribers and, and it's real time data. So we can actually, you know, use this information in that moment, especially when all of us are being exposed to such new drugs and don't have a lot of data or information. So obviously, this is a very, very, you know, new approach, and it's a fantastic approach. So in terms of what are some of the advantages that you've, or since the establishment, what are some of the advantages of such a registry, do you think in Canada, besides, you know, having that real time information? So what we've got currently sitting uh, in front of us is about 360 participants nationally. Yeah. Half of those are infectious disease, medical microbiology, and the other half are clinical pharmacists uh, specializing in infectious diseases, antimicrobial stewardship. And these individuals, every two, three months, get the latest information of how these antibodies are being used from us. So what we're doing is we're sharing the information that they themselves have told us. So right. we'll have data submitters across Canada, clinical pharmacists, infectious disease specialists. They submit data when they use these antibiotics. We crunch it. And every two, three months, we send them all the data. So it's Canadians right. teaching Canadians how these antibiotics are being used in their hands. So the benefit is it's Canadians helping Canadians sharing Canadian experiences. And as many of us know, in the infectious disease world and microbiology world, is that definitely anti antibiograms differ from different countries and our experience and access to medications. And so having this data for us nationally is super helpful, especially myself being a prescriber. I think this is the information that we're always looking for, especially when providing patient care. So so I'm, I'm um, more interested to hear what type of data is being gathered in the registry. And and you did mention that it's, you know, collaborated data. Um, and so where is this data stored or how is it analyzed on your guys' end? So on our end, we decided in 2019 that every single new IV antibiotic mm -hmm. that was Health Canada approved and marketed in Canada we would have on the clear registry. So we currently have four IV antibiotics, okay. ceftopipril, ceftolzine, tazobactam, intravenous phosphomycin, right. and dalbavancin. And so what we do is for our 360 participants, and by the way, how do you become a participant? It's free. You okay. send your Zanel an email and just say, hey, make me a part of clear. Boom, it's done. And you're a part of clear. That's awesome. And if you choose to submit data, that's fantastic. But yeah. minimally, you're going to be educated. So for these four IV antibiotics, we have a link yeah. that we send out to all of our participants. If they have treated a patient with one of these new drugs or will treat a patient, you hit that link and it's easy peasy. It's three minutes on yeah. your phone, iPad, laptop, desktop. Right. 17 questions pop down. And it's point and click. You're done in three minutes. 
And it's asking you things like, well, what infection are you treating? Yeah. What is the pathogen? Are you using the antibiotic alone or in combination? What dose are you using? By the way, did you do antimicrobial susceptibility testing? And if so, what method? What was the MIC? Why did you use it? Was it because of resistance to other antibiotics? Is it right. because you clinically failed previous therapy? Was it because of intolerance to other agents? Microbiologically, did it work? Clinically, right. did it work? Were there adverse effects? So you point, click, point, click, point, click, you are done. And then what we do is the data is stored on red cap. This is this electronic data capture system. And uh, uh, Melanie Baxter in our group is the guru. She crunches it all. And then we put PowerPoint slides together, send it out to the group. We also present ideally each year a poster on every drug at AMI, at the mm -hmm. AMI CACBID meeting. Yeah. And then we also publish... Uh, papers, once we get to about 30 to 50 patients, we'll actually write up a paper and publish it. So we've done that for all of the antibiotics already, except Dalbavance. And we have yet to publish a paper on this. We've presented okay. a poster because we're still not where we want in terms of the numbers of patients. That's fair. And and when you say that in terms of number of patients, what is the threshold that you're hitting before this data becomes finalized? Rupina, the threshold is whatever George Zanel thinks the threshold is. It's so, <laughs> terrible. So <laughs> I've kind of set a bar of if we hit 30 ish, 20, 30 patients, yeah. we'll put a poster together at AMI so okay. Canadians can see what's going on. Uh, even well before that, we crunch the data, send it to all the participants, even yeah. if it's only six patients. But once we start to hit around 50, the journals get interested. Because right. then you've got some substantial data. So once we hit 50, we published a, a paper on ceftobiprol. We published a paper on ceftolzane tazo. We published a paper on intravenous phosphomycin. And okay. we're still not at 50 for the dalbobansin. But right. once we're there, we'll publish a paper on that. But there is no hard and fast rules, but that's kind of the threshold. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And and you kind of mentioned that you're you're really looking at novel IV antibiotics. Um, so in terms of is there other criteria in how you decide which medications to review? No. So my criteria really are if you're a new IV antibiotic, Health Canada approved and you're on the market, we want you in clear. Okay. So we try not to bias and say, we don't want this one. We don't want that one. We want them all. But I will tell you when intravenous amoxicillin clavulinate came to the market, which was relatively recently, I hummed and hawed whether I should put this on the clear registry. And initially I thought, well, of course it should be. Yeah. But then a colleague said to me, we know exactly how it's used. It's used like the oral, which we've had for 35 years, <laughs> just when you can't use the oral. Right. So we didn't put it on the clear registry. And yet I have some colleagues bugging me to say, hey, put it on there. So it may actually, in fact, join the registry sooner than later. Yeah, I think honestly being so I'm a pediatric infectious disease physician. And so amoxclav, you know, we use a lot. And and there I think there is, you know, a, a different I guess there is a couple of indications where sometimes I feel more comfortable using an IV version and IV moxlav, for instance, you know, if you do have a polymicrobial infection where you're not necessarily worried about pseudomonas. And I think it's some of that information that's really good to disseminate because sometimes we don't really think about using a moxclav in, you know, in an initial setting like that, but remembering that the IV formulation or even just knowing that there is an IV formulation, because I think that is, you know, some data that hasn't been, um, I guess, widely spread just because it is a novel agent or a novel formulation. Well, you've inspired me, Rupina, <laughs> this, this summer to um, put a proposal together to put IV moxclav onto the clear registry. I'll, uh, put together the 17 important questions we need to ask and uh, run it by the clear group that we have across Canada, get their input. You may get an email or yourself. Oh, um, I'm already, I'm already joining. So I, there's no doubt about that. <laughs> we get an email. Are these the best questions or should we uh, add or delete, have other questions, yeah. but uh, perhaps this fall, 
we should have IV box clav join the clear yeah. registry. Yeah. And I think it's important also from like uh, an adverse event standpoint, right? So form different formulations may have different adverse effects, right? Or how quick, uh, for instance, like bone marrow suppression may occur, et cetera. So I think it's important to, if something is new and novel, because I know that people definitely are looking out there for data. I'm always doing that as a prescriber. Um, Thank so you I, so yeah. much. You've inspired me and uh, <laughs> you've made strong cases. Uh, we're going to do whatever we can to put IV box clav on the clear registry this fall. <laughs> awesome. And and just like how you inform me that right now. So do you inform participants that are, you know, when newer drugs are being added to the registry for a review? So do they receive an email for once they're once they are a participant in the registry? Do they receive an email once a new questionnaire comes on the market? Yes. So. It's a balancing of not wanting to b bombard them because everyone gets so many emails. I don't want them to shut down. <laughs> so I'll typically send somewhere around three to four emails a year. Okay. And it's always loaded with here's the new information. Here's the slides of nice. the four drugs for your information. And then if there are new developments. So, for nice. example, recently when intravenous Dalbavancin came onto the market, mm -hmm. we immediately sent an email to all the participants saying, great news, Dalva right. has been Health Canada approved and is marketed with this indication. Here is the clear link to IV Dalva okay. If you have treated or will treat a patient with this drug, please consider joining. And again, as always, it's voluntary, but it's ethics approved. We're not asking for any confidential patient information. Please consider uh, joining and we frequently get emails back saying, oh, I didn't even know it was on the market. We're serving an educational tool at times. Exactly. I think a lot of that is, that's very important, right? Because it's really important to know which medications are out there. And then also knowing the detail of data that you're providing, including indications um, and contraindications and, and really uses and an anecdotal experience from our colleagues, you know, I think that there's multiple times in a day when I'm practicing, when I have to reach out to friends across the nation to ask questions about this. And so what better way to do this than in a registry where people have already inputted this data. So I think this is honestly fantastic. And it's it's the future of Canada. And I think it's great to have local data. So I'm very impressed. So, Rupina, you said something really important. It's it's this um, almost unexpectedness when you actually start to crunch the data per drug. Yeah. You think you know what's going on in Canada and you realize you don't <laughs> because the users yeah. of these drugs inform you what they're doing and it's on label, it's off label, right. all types of dosing. There are clear partnerships with infectious diseases and clinical pharmacy right. using, you know, renal function to customize dosing and optimize pharmacodynamics. So it's very educational when right. you find out what's going on by crunching the data, what Canadians are doing. And so currently, which centers or participants, I think you mentioned over 300 participants. And so is it pretty much national? You have representation from most provinces? A representation from all provinces. It's been, uh, I, I was a little bit shocked and surprised that uh, the uptake was so vigorous and so positive. Other countries have tried this and they have not been able to make it work. But, you know, in Canada, I think we all kind of love each other and realize that we're just <laughs> a bunch of Canadians who were born somewhere else. So we <laughs> want to contribute. So uh, coast to coast, I, I'm going to say 98% of all the participants mm -hmm. are infectious disease, microbiology and clinical pharmacy. And then we've got sprinklings of intensive intensivists, uh, respirologists, internists, just other groups. Nice. And I'm going to say about 98% of the participants are Canadian. But interestingly enough, we have a bunch of people from all over the world from Italy and Chile and South Africa following the clear registry. And I don't know if they're Canadians working off site or just colleagues interested in antimicrobial usage, right. but that's the demographic. Uh, in terms of data submitters, the people who actually point and click, it's 50-50. 
Half of the submissions are infectious disease microbiology, half are clinical pharmacists. And frequently these groups are working together and they just say, look, I'll submit the data on this patient. But I frequently get asked, well, what about duplications? Right. We don't have duplications. We look for them very, very carefully, but clearly the team is talking to each other and saying, hey, why don't you uh, enter this data on the clear registry? Yeah. And that's fantastic. I think for our listeners as well to know that, you know, it's not just physicians that are part of the registry. Um, and we do have really anybody that's involved in in prescribing um, and who's aware um, and working in that multi and most of us are working in a multidisciplinary team environment these days. And so we have pharmacists on board and other um, specialties as well. So I think it's nice to know that anybody could be involved who, who knows some information um, about the medication. So I think some of our audience are probably more eager to know uh, some of the data. So why don't we walk through maybe one of the medications that you guys have reviewed and, and just have a, a quick, you know, data synopsis uh, for one of the medications that you have reviewed in, in the clear registry. It's a great idea. And I, I'm going to start with ceftobiprol. And the reason is this is the drug that really started the clear registry. When it came out, uh, mm -hmm. colleagues were asking, you know, who's using this drug and what for? And this really drove the development of clear. So it's a good drug to start with. So ceftobiprol, we have had, we've now published a couple of posters at AMI, a paper in the Journal of Global Antimicrobial Resistance. We crunched the data in May, sent it out to all the clear participants. But this is the excitement of it, of okay. what you find out how this drug is being used. So to give you a little bit of data, our clinicians in Canada using intravenous ceftobiprol, well, first of all, it's mostly for adults, but there we, we do have some pediatric data to the clear registry. It is primarily used because of resistance to other agents. So clinicians, because of resistance to other drugs, they choose ceftobiprol. What kind of infections are being treated with ceftobiprol? On-label, Health Canada approved indications, and non. It's everything under the sun. Bacteremia, a lot of endocarditis, hmm. bone and joint infections, hospital-acquired pneumonia, community acquired pneumonia, central nervous system infections, all types of infections, but it's being used almost invariably as directed therapy when a clinician grows MRSA. Okay. In virtually all of the cases, these are documented infections caused by MRSA. And typically the patient is not responding to vancomycin, or not responding to daptomycin, Indian clinicians are saying, I'm going to add ceftobiprol to the treatment. They don't take away the vanc or dapto, to add the ceftobiprol to treatment. So whether you've got endocarditis or a bacteremia or bone and joint or a pneumonia documented to be caused by MRSA, they start ceftobiprol treatment. And then you have these other interesting things. Do you do antimicrobial susceptibility testing? More than half of the center said, no, we don't need to. Okay. Because we know from the CANWAR data, the mm -hmm. national CANWAR data, all of the MRSA are susceptible to ceftobiprol. So we know the answer is it will be susceptible. So half of them don't even do it. The other half do. DISCs, E-tests, whatever they're doing. Okay. And then it comes down to the dosing, and the dosing's fascinating because I'm going to say about two-thirds of the time, it's 500 milligrams every eight hours, but in almost everyone, it's the prolonged two-hour or longer infusion as per the label to optimize the pharmacodynamics. Okay. And in the other third, it is being dosed in relation to renal function. Every single patient who's being treated with ceftobiprol has had their creatinine clearance calculated. So this is what I talked about, clinical pharmacy working with infectious mm -hmm. disease and customizing the treatment to that patient. And then when you get into the outcomes, the microbiological success astonishingly is over 90%. Wow. The mm. clinical cure rates are around 85%. 
And these are patients who have been failing vancos, failing DAPTO. They've got MRSA in the blood. They've got MRSA endocarditis, bones, lungs. And they're being treated. I don't want to call it as salvage therapy, but they failed the initial therapy. Now it's being added on. And surprisingly, they're doing astonishingly well, knowing that over 90% of these patients are back to remit. Right. Whether it's the pneumonia or endocarditis or whatever, they're, the vast majority are back to remit. Mm-hmm. Doing well microbiologically, we're eradicating the organism and clinically they're doing well. And then on the adverse effects side, we basically got the news that we expected. It's a beta lactam. Yeah. It's the cephalosporin. <laughs> so the safety has been outstanding. We've had a couple of patients with gastrointestinal intolerance. We had one patient with some hypersensitivity, but none of the three necessitated drug discontinuation. You know, for me, I always ask, well, I I know you've had a side effect. Did you stop the drug? If you don't stop the drug, it means the side effect was reasonably tolerated and you decided to persevere. So lots of exciting data. We know when it's being used, how it's being used. It's uh, the outcomes are quite good and it's safe. Yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, just in a few of those sentences there, I mean, definitely gave me more information as to when to use septabipril. And I think really the role of the registry and the purpose of the registry is to provide this real-time data and and give us information on, you know, what when can we use it? Because I think that's always the question, especially when you're in a crunch like that, when you have a patient that's not responding you know that, you know, there's not very many drugs out there that are going to treat MRSA. And so having more information on, you know, a drug that you can add for combination therapy, I think like from a prescriber standpoint, the comfort of having such data also, and knowing that there is success rates of more than 90% is is such helpful information. And the great news is this is not American data or data from Italy or Spain or France or South yeah. Korea. This is what your colleagues are doing across the country in neighboring Alberta, neighboring Manitoba, British Columbia to Newfoundland, Ontario, Quebec. Yeah. This is what they're all doing. No, that's fantastic. Yeah. And so you did mention, and this is just out of interest because I'm a pediatric <laughs> subspecialist. And so in terms of some of these medications, I mean, it's always a challenge for getting dosing for us and um, and, and further, you know, knowing which indications, because we extrapolate most of our data from adult data, uh, just because, you know, there aren't a lot of RCTs in pediatrics. And so within the same data, do you include the pediatric data and then provide that to all physicians? Or is that only, only if somebody is specifically, you know, interested in having access to the pediatric data, or is this all combined? We do make it clear that there's pediatric use to all of our participants. Mm -hmm. You know, I've got a lot of really important women in my life, uh, (laughs) a really important person, Dr. Joanne Embry, who was my boss for 12 years uh, here in Winnipeg in the medical school for a long time, pediatric infectious diseases specialist like yourself, would always say to me, Kids are not little adults. Hey, nope. they're, kids. they're different. And uh, it stuck with me for the last 35 years. So unfortunately, as you know, we frequently forget about children when it comes to antimicrobial development. We study adults, yeah. um, frequently more men in the, than women. And right. then we say, well, we think this is appropriate guidance for everyone. So we're late to the game with studying children, yeah. dosing, efficacy, are there unique side effects? And many of these drugs are not even indicated to be used in children. But, you know, like most things, clinicians in Canada don't really necessarily care what all the indications are. Their job is risk versus benefit. In my patient, if I think the benefit of using ceftobiprol or subtolzine tazobactam or intravenous phosphomycin or dalbovancin, if the benefit outweighs my perceived risk, yeah, I'm going to use it in this patient for this infection or this age group, even though it may be off label. So I did find it somewhat surprising. But yes, we share the pediatric data with the participants, whatever uh, data we get, it goes to them and they see it. 
Okay. And I think just for our listeners, I think this is also important for especially the pediatricians out there is that, you know, being part of this registry is going to be helpful for us too, right? And so I think encouraging that more pediatric data be inputted into the registry and analyze similar to adult data, um, I think that really, for me, would be helpful um, in the coming years, especially as we're seeing more antimicrobial resistance in, in the younger populations. Well, Rupina, you got me all excited today because I think intravenous amoxicillin and clavulinate could be what ignites our pediatric infectious disease specialists across Canada Definitely. To in to clear even more. Oh, that's great. So we know a little bit more about the future of the registry. So what else? What else is what's new? Like, what are we so, bringing in? What other newer drugs are coming in? So my my vision is what I would like to happen is that a typical IV antibiotic is on the registry maximum two to three years. Okay. And once we've had two to three AMI posters over the years, a paper or two, we've presented this data in hospitals across Canada. Our clear participants have had slide package after slide package. At some point, there's a time where clinicians in Canada say, well, this is not a new agent anymore. We know how to use it. We know when to use it. And I'd like to see it fall off the registry. Yeah. And I'd like to see new drugs come into the registry. So I would love two, three years once you've been in, you fall off the registry. And then ideally every single new antimicrobial that comes in joins the registry. So what could be the future? You've inspired me with a box clav, as you know. <laughs> so I will get on that over the summer. But awesome. then we're trying to work, we're working, we're doing research with all the companies and trying to convince Imipenemrella Bactam, Meropenem Vabor Bactam, mm -hmm. Ciftazidem Avibactam, Cifiteracol, potentially uh, Aztrianam Avibactam, which just got approved in the United States, and many others come to Canada. Yeah. You know, in Canada, these agents are not going to be used a lot. They're going to be used within the context of an antimicrobial stewardship program by right. specialists. But we know that the special access program doesn't work well for acute infectious diseases. When Dr. Rupina has a patient with a multi-drug resistant pathogen yeah. and they're critically ill, you can't wait five days or eight days for this drug to come from Health Canada. You need to have the drug used within an hour or two. Yeah. So we're trying to convince companies that Canada is important. Bring these agents to Canada. We really need them in select cases to maximize patient outcomes. So every single one of the new ones that comes in, we're going to have them join clear. We're yeah. going to help Canadians educate other Canadians of how and why these drugs are being used. And I'm hoping this is a mobile process. So drugs are coming out, drugs are coming in, and it just keeps moving forward over the next several years. Yeah. And I think you bring a very important point to, you know, to, to the front of the list here is that we really need newer agents and we need data on newer agents. And I think some of the approvals are always lacking because we don't have local national data. But because we, you know, are are looking at these medications in real time, I think that, you know, provides us with even a stronger case to bring in such drugs into Canada and have them at our fingertips when we are in a tight situation where we, you know, are struggling to manage a patient. So I think that's that's really another advantage of such a, a of a registry that's national. You're absolutely right. And I can tell you from traveling again uh, within Canada post-COVID, mm -hmm. the infectious disease community, you know, is relatively small. We all know each other coast to coast. Yes. And there's a real need for some of these new agents to be used in select cases. Clinicians would like them on the shelf, ready to go if and when I need them. The good news is that I think Health Canada really understands this as well. Yeah. I visited Health Canada several times over the last few years. I've presented some of our national CanWard resistance data. They get resistance is a problem in Canada. We have ESBLs. We yes. have CREs. We have MRSA. We have VRE. We have multidrug-resistant pseudomonas. We have these pathogens, and we need some new treatments. 
They understand the need for new antimicrobials. They're ready to partner with industry to facilitate the approval process. Yeah. I think we just need some uh, bold companies to want to come to Canada to say, look, I know the patient clientele will be small, but yeah. we need to do this for Canada and we'll find a way to make it work. And I'm confident that with our strong infectious disease community in Canada, Health Canada working together with industry, we'll, we'll find a way to get this done. Yeah, exactly. Well, thank you, Dr. Zanel, so much for being such a strong advocator for all of us prescribers, because I know that all of us every single day are talking about this, but just, you know, you just don't have, sometimes you just don't have the pathway to, you know, how do you get to getting a new drug approved? And so I think the clear registry is is one of those gateways. And I, I'm super excited that we have such a registry. And I'm also excited to hear all about this because now I'm aware of it and I can, you know, share this information. And that's what I would suggest to our viewers today is share with others that there is something like a registry like this that exists within Canada. It's a very easy process and it's really information spreading. And it's important for us to have such important data locally. Rapina, for me, three quick thank yous. <clears throat> a yeah. big one to you. You know, I'm super honored <laughs> to be a uh, part of this podcast with you. I was delighted when you emailed me. Thank you so much. And thank you for what you're doing with your podcasts. Um, two, thanks to your uh, listeners yeah. for listening and perhaps even joining Clear and being a participant or a data submitter. And lastly, uh, I want to thank the clear participants and the data submitters. You know, without them, you and I are not talking. You know, without them, it's just George Zanel intellectually masturbating. But they're the ones who actually do all the work. Yes. So I'm really thankful to Canadian clinicians, infectious right. disease specialists, clinical pharmacists, microbiologists for everything they are doing to make clear such a success. Thank you. Thank you to all of them. Yeah, no, that's great. Of course. And and so for, I guess, our listeners out there, I know you mentioned last time that it's just a quick email to yourself. So is this email something that they can find online for you and and then just email you and and be part of the registry? Absolutely. So, you know, you can just Google George Zanel, Z-H-A-N-E-L, and you'll find it uh, right there. Or, you know, it's G-G Zanel, Z-H-A-N-E-L, at P csinternet.ca and the email says hey clear c-l-e-a-r i want to join boom it's done awesome that's fantastic and then i know you did mention that previously because there's no demographics or patient information that's being shared so i don't think that centers would have to have any prior like ethics approval from their center to be part of the registry is that correct we have had no center tell us this is a problem we are ethics approved. We took it through the University of Manitoba, but there are there's absolutely no patient identifiers that we are requesting, no confidential patient information. We are asking for the basics, the infection, the pathogen, the dose, all that. So we have never had a site say that this is a problem for them. That's fantastic. So really easy, just an email away. And, you know, they could, the center could be involved in, and maybe the future of the registry is to get more and more centers involved. So we, you know, can amplify our data um, and, and have quicker turnaround time. Maybe we could review medications at a quicker pace when we have larger participant um, involvement. So I think that's, that's fantastic. So for our listeners and our viewers today, is there is there um, anything that one key message that you want to provide before we finish off this podcast today? I guess my only uh, last message would be clear has been an unbelievable success story because Canadians, Canadian clinicians want it to be a success story. Mm -hmm. And I'm just very thankful to the people who take the time to hit that link and spend the three minutes point and click, point and click. And we've had tremendous success coast to coast, but you're right, the more the merrier. Thank you all for what you're doing with the Clear Registry. Thank you to you, Rupina, for helping me advertise it. Of course, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's been a fun ride with it and I'm just hoping that it continues to be a success. 
All right. Well, we are so grateful to have you on this podcast today. And as I always let our viewers and listeners know that this podcast is mainly for informational purposes and in no way to endorse a product or in place of an infectious disease consult. As, as we um, kind of exit the podcast today, I really am honored to have you here today, Dr. Zanel, and I'm so excited for the future of CLEAR. And uh, it's honestly so fantastic because all of us want to do certain things like this, but, you know, everybody has a busy schedule. You have a very, very busy schedule and you're able to establish such an important registry. And so we're super thankful um, and, it's, and it's really an honor to have you today. Thank you again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Pirawal and Dr. Zanel. For more information on the Clear Registry and to join, please email Dr. Zanel at ggzanel at pcsinternet.ca. Have a topic suggestion? Email us at the Canadian Breakpoint at gmail.com and follow us on Twitter at CA Breakpoint. See you again soon at the Canadian Breakpoint. <laughs>